so some of the societal analysis in your role to be able to help change society, science is a bit of a side um, And, um, you know, I'm going to start by saying the World Health Organization did an international commission on social determinants of health a couple of years ago. And they ended that commission by saying that social injustice is killing people on a grand scale. And I think that most of you in this room, we all pretty much know that social and economic circumstances of people's lives have in fact a greater influence on individual community health status than medical care and personal health behaviors. But you might not know the extent to which that's true. A Senate subcommittee found that socioeconomic factors account for fully 50% of all health outcomes, while healthcare, genetics, and physical environment account for 25%, 15%, and 10% respectively. And I think a lot of us also too think about the really big population differences in quality of life and health indicators as existing between countries or between continents. Um, less of us know that a child born in Nunavik in northern Quebec has a life expectancy of less than 67 years. That's a similar lifespan to someone born in Uzbekistan or Tonga, and it's 14 years less than the Canadian average. Um, or that there's an 11 year gap in life expectancy um, for boys born in Montreal's wealthiest and poorest neighborhoods. Or that the child immunization rate in Saskatoon is nearly 50% between the best off and the worst off neighborhoods. So that the patterns of being better, the better off individuals, those wealthier, the people with more privilege, being healthier, happens at every stage of the social ladder. It's not just that there are some people who are worse off and the rest of us are fine with universal health care. Um, but most of those differences are systematic and avoidable. And because they're avoidable, I suggest they're unfair. And we know that Canadians care a lot about fairness, so do most nurses. And inequities also matter, not just because they're unfair, but because when you have high differences, in particular in health status between groups and the population, the impact is on everybody. The health status of the overall population is lower. So it's a disadvantage for all of us. Um, so now I'm going to shift and I'm going to move into some stories. And I'm, I'm going to deviate from what I usually do because I'm not going to tell you any stories about me or what I've done. Um, I have a real privilege as a non-nurse. I call myself sometimes an almost nurse, of being able to tell you about nurses that I've loved, admired, learned from, worked with, been challenged by, received appreciation from. And my own experiences come up in that dialogue, in the conversation at the end, if it works. And I'm also, although I have worked internationally and um, with uh, mixed country teams and a little bit overseas, um, I'm really going to talk about Canadian stories. So my grandmother, um, the first nurse I'm going to mention, was born in 1886. <laughs> She grew up in a family with upwardly mobile aspirations. They wanted to marry her well. She wanted to be a nurse. To become a nurse, she left England. She came to the US as a young single person. And I remember her telling me stories that she moved into nursing because she wanted to help people lessen their burden. Not a word that we use much today, but it was a broad sense of the weight that people carried. And she started her career in immigrant ranch and financially poor neighborhoods in New York. So a really huge change for her. My mom was a nurse. Now you're getting why I wasn't a nurse. I was going to be anything but a nurse when I was 18 or 20. Um, and my mom, um, for most of her career, was a school nurse. She worked for the school board um, rather than for um, a health authority. And um, my mom, thinking about your theme, was somebody who one of her favorite questions for most of her life, she would ask even strangers, what are you passionate about? What's your passion? And her passion um, was living her life through nursing. And um, as a school nurse, she did deliver immunization, she delivered screening programs, she dealt with the numerous nerves, I don't feel very well today. Um, but by her request, she worked in high need schools as well as um, a little bit in lower need schools. Um, and she identified social factors that affected the lives of disadvantaged kids. She studied Spanish in her own time so that she could work within the community and interact with families. Um, she attended school board meetings, she obtained permission within her job to co-develop and propose board policy changes. In her personal life, my mother also carried out her activism. She was pro-choice way before birth control or abortion were legalized, because as a graduate student nurse, she had observed in the hospital where she worked 
how poor women arrived, bleeding, injured, and sometimes tragically died from home abortion attempts, whereas middle class and wealthier women quietly and discreetly received dilation and curettage for menstrual irregularities and went home not the worse. At my mom's memorial service, I learned that she conceived of and helped plan a local method for tracking voting records and managing letter writing campaigns that was picked up at a state level and then picked up at other states. Um, she never touted the influence she had, but she made a huge impact by doing that kind of work. Um, and she got involved very early on. I was still uh, fairly young when she got involved in anti-racist work. And so not only did she join a group to do that work because she could see the impacts as our community, became more diverse culturally and ethically, um, but she searched out a broader circle of friends with different backgrounds from her so that she could listen and learn from them. As a young feminist health activist myself, I had the pleasure of knowing nurses in Toronto who formed what was called the Radical Nurses Group. In those days, uh, major media had no health reporters, women's studies classes were barely um, uh, conceived of, and as a collective, these women developed what today we would call a gender analysis to understand the female dominant nature of nursing, both why women chose nursing and how nursing was constrained as a women's profession. Equally, they learned about racism, classism, and the structural ways that societal power and privilege is established and maintained. They sought to figure out how they could counteract those influences as nurses and through their nursing practice. So within paid work, um, women worked in that group, worked in Northern Labrador, they worked in large mental hospitals, they worked in inner city clinics, they helped start innovative nursing programs. In their volunteer lives, um, somebody helped start a women's health magazine, somebody else formed a women's health network, um, other people established grassroots community programs. And I think of your theme, these women's cultivated passion, and they motivated action. So I'm going to tell you about two of them. Liz Jansen is one of my dearest friends. She was my boss at one point, and she's been one of my most important peers. She started her career as a hospital psychiatric nurse. She ended up in public health, she admits, because she had a tiny daughter, and she realized public health didn't have shift work. But she also took it because she cared about social justice. And she had an opportunity in public health to work on prevention and health promotion to get at root causes of the diseases she saw in hospitals. And she was able to work on reducing inequalities in the community so that more people had a better chance of staying healthy throughout their life. When she retired last year, she was Toronto Senior Nursing Officer. And before that, as a nurse in Toronto Public Health, she had helped found the Women Abuse Council. She would helped form a crisis intervention uh, center for adults experiencing mental health challenges. She helped develop harm reduction strategies, including controversial needle exchange. She co-conceived of what I think was Canada's first food policy council. She supported the startup of drug court, an alternative um, kind of treatment to avoid incarceration for um, people with drug addictions, and supervised frontline community uh, development workers and nurses working throughout um, uh, challenged neighborhoods. Another woman I want to tell you about is Kathy Crow. Um, Kathy was one of the first nurses employed by Street Health, Toronto's first health service tailored for individuals um, who are homeless and under house. And many of you will have bumped into Kathy's name because she has a better national stature. Um, street Health was started by volunteer nurses because street involved people said they trusted nurses. And that's a piece that I want you to remember. Um, Kathy always combined policy intervention and advocacy with her direct service work. Um, so, in the late 1990s, she founded the Toronto Disaster Relief Committee, which um, tried to declare homelessness a national, a natural, a national disaster at the scale of a hurricane or a tsunami, and to demand that kind of response. Um, when Tenth City, a squatter community, was formed on 29 acres of industrial zone land, and people lived there for four years in downtown Toronto, um, the Disaster Relief Committee and Kathy kind of, brought in outhouses, they brought in water hoses, they prefabricated shelters, but equally they became very much sought after voices to the media and they advocated for it for policy. And there were changes um, following Tenth City to Toronto's policy, and Kathy went on to get a national, um, uh, or 
to get a big award that allowed her to advocate for a national housing strategy and wrote Dying for a Home. And it's a wonderful book to read. Um, and she continues. I think both of those women mentor young nurses and love doing that. So I just want to end by kind of saying that um, a, a doctor friend of mine and a colleague in Sudbury talks about health equity of the water in which we swim. And we all have to think about how in every part of your job can you be addressing health equity. And so I think I'm out of time, but the two things that I was going to kind of talk to and I'll go back to if you'd like, is that the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health has identified some roles that we think are most important for local work in public health to be addressing health equity. And I think they apply equally to your individual work, even if you move into a clinical setting. And it has to do with keeping track of, assessing and reporting, helping to modify interventions, make them different, partnering as much as you can, and both stepping into leadership, alongside leadership and forward leadership, and using advocacy. And then we've also been looking at um, what are the factors that help successful leaders in public health who are doing equity work um, be able to be successful leaders in health equity work. And organizationally, successful leaders tend to work in organizations where policy commitment extends throughout an organization so that the commitment is broad. They tend to be placed where they can make a bridge between their organization and their community. They can work in and with community as well as in their organizations and they can bring organizational resources to community. Um, and professionally, they have knowledge, skills and attitudes to be able to work with the complex and multifaceted issues that affect determinants of health. Um, and they tend to do that, life, that work through their personal life and their career life. Um, thank you. Justice issues, uh, has taught nursing and community health not only in Canada but in Africa and the Middle East, uh, and has combined her passion with community development and nursing uh, almost from the very beginning. Um, so, um, Colleen uh, divides her time between the Cody Institute, which is uh, an institute that works a lot in the area of development in general, I think, and uh, uh, bringing some of those skills, and then also at the School of Nursing at the St. Francis Xavier. So, really interesting uh, career as a nurse as well. So, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to come and share some of my experiences, um, which is what I'm going to talk to you about uh, when we talk about cultivating passion and motivating action. Uh, I think from my passion comes from my experience that I've had as a nurse. And um, I guess I'll start. When I first graduated from nursing, the School of Nursing in Annie Kanish in 1974, a couple of friends and I, we jumped in a cold car and we drove across the country and ran out of money in Calgary, so stopped and got a job. And uh, had no idea where we were actually going, but we were just free and just going. And, uh, and I ended up working on a Blackfoot Indian Reserve. Had no idea. And a small 10-bed hospital on this reserve about 50 miles outside of Calgary. And uh, it was a fantastic learning experience. I encourage all of you to go to very small places because you get to do everything. Um, one of the things that stuck with me from that experience was the racism. I was totally flabbergasted and floored by the racism um, that I heard and saw when I was there. And racism from the other nurses was just so blatant. And I was like, oh my gosh, we don't have that in Nova Scotia. Huh. When I came back to Nova Scotia, I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> We have racism in Nova Scotia, and I hadn't seen it my whole time growing up. But the fact that I went away and I saw things differently, when I came back, I was able to see things differently. And I think that was a very important for me, and I've had many experiences doing that. Um, <clears throat> after I had a couple of years of experience, 
experience nursing out west and, and in Cancel, Nova Scotia. Uh, I went overseas. I spent